We're about to start our first high-level multi-stakeholder panel. Monsieur Veil, if you may take a chair. So, we have uh, five great panelists today. Um, my name is David Martineau, I'm the French ambassador for digital affairs, which means as a French diplomat talking on UN premises, my duty is to speak French. So this is exactly what I'm going to do, mostly. Otherwise, it will probably be the last time you would see me here. Uh, nous avons... <laughs> nous avons... We have five panelists, very high-level panelists. Gabriel, uh, as you knew, had to leave us in a hurry to make her way to the airport. So we have Audrey Azoulay, Director General of UNESCO. We have Adra Ouattara, Minister of the Digital Economy Development of the Burkina Faso. We have Stéphane Richard, who's the, P uh, who's the CEO of Orange. Uh, we have Isabelle Falke Pierrotin, outgoing president of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners and chair of the National Commission on Informatics and Liberty, and Joran Marbi. I can, Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers. Je voudrais Let me first of all make an announcement. The uh, site, the UN. Uh, site and, and the site of the United Government Forum was uh, was uh, attacked DDoS. Uh, and so, uh, which we can in fact acknowledge as being a, a recognition of the role played by the IGF. The IGF is the place to be, and we welcome this as a as an homage. Um, having said that, of course, as you know, the. Le Forum sur la gouvernance de l'Internet. Le Forum, le IGF. Et depuis sa création. Ever since its creation, at the World Summit on the Information Society 2005 has been the place where the new challenges and new questions linked to digitalization in the world have been identified. That's its role. That's the role uh, uh, which its mandate stipulates that it is to issue recommendations. Our panel is going to take that up. Uh, we've invited representatives of states, of international organizations, of uh, the private sector, and of uh, technicians. Uh, without further ado, since you have to host the President of Colombia in just a few minutes, let me give you the floor and ask you what UNESCO's point of view is on all of these new digitally related matters. Thank you very much. Once again, welcome to all of you. Here at UNESCO, I'd like to apologize in advance because I'm going to have to leave you before the session is over. But I wanted to take part in this panel, which I think is taking up a central issue. For us, for UNESCO, I would like to say what the issues are in this digital world. Let me uh, say that the first uh, challenge is not to leave anyone on the side of the road. What's important for us in the UN is inclusiveness. Well, well with UNESCO's universal um, goals, uh, the uh, gap that might exist, the digital divide, is something we note every day. Half of the uh, world's population is connected, but that means the other half isn't. And that gap between the less developed countries and the more developed ones is extremely strong and it serves to further worsen existing inequalities. So the first of our concerns is to bridge that gap and to work on uh, equipping uh, the world to be uh, connected. In Africa, less than 22% of the population has internet access, whereas 80% does in Europe. If we look at the impact of that on employment, on the access to the world of knowledge, well, that's something that is just unacceptable. It's also, there's also a gap between men and women, a very wide one, and which is only widening. I'd like to come back to that because we'd like to work on that through education. Last but not least, 
the universality of the internet means that we have to work to reach the most marginalized, the most far-flung populations. How are we dealing with these subjects at UNESCO? I'm not going to have the time to cover all of that, but I think that the most important issue is that of education. Education uh, f from digital technologies, uh, education in the digital world, which should be included in school curricula, as well as teaching methods, because that opens up new um, tools for uh, teachers. It should also, uh, the education should also uh, be a way of, of uh, training people to be, to have a critical judgment on what circulates on the web and on the social media, as well as to deal with uh, gender inequality, education of women in science, because uh, what is uh, in the making is a world of science in the digital world. And in the sciences, there are major inequalities between men and women in the, uh, in the professions of, of, of research, particularly uh, digital research. We like to support member states in helping to attack that problem. It is also for us uh, an issue of culture, cultural diversity. Uh, in uh, the Internet, there isn't cultural diversity today. You can see that when you look at the publications on human, uh, in human sciences and in exact sciences on the Internet. Those publications are, for the most part, in English, in a single language. And that, of course, raises the problem of the, the, the rating of universities and the preservation of ac academic and cultural diversity, what with the question of uh, remunerating creators. Diversité culturelle, because you know that UNESCO is the house of the 2005 Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expression, which we have adapted through its digital implementation. And it's also a major issue for cultural diversity for the development of creative economies, that is to adapt to digital technology and to uh, compensate innovation in this area. Because here as well, you can see major inequalities between the world of creation and the world of distribution. And then the third point I'd like to mention, which is very important and was also mentioned with the Secretary General of the United, of the United Nations, is the ethical question. That is the question leading to values, leading to the world that we want to see in the future. And this is a world that is not uh, apart from civilization, from what we've built so far, from what we've succeeded in creating since 1945 in particular. And that's why we need to work on the issue of ethical principles. We need to have a debate on it that is universal in scope, global in scope, because there are different perspectives on different schools of thought, different approaches throughout the world. But this is a global issue. And so if we have a separate or divisive ethic, ethical principle, then it's the same as not having one. So we need to work to develop guiding principles that can help to steer humanity's conscience in this new digital world. And to conclude, I would like to cite an Israeli historian and philosopher whose uh, works are very important when it comes to the uh, 21st century challenges, and he has a humanist agenda regarding the world that we're living in. And for us at UNESCO, our role is to promote humanism and bring it into the digital world so it's not a separate world, so that it can also help to promote development and our values in a world that's still inclusive, that's still a human world, not a cold, sterile, digital, unequal world. And so we also need to focus on science, of course, including computer science, digital sciences, hard sciences, and also social sciences, philosophy, history. And so next weekend, here at UNESCO, we'll be holding Philosophy Night, and I invite all of you to take part in it. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking part in this meeting, and we'll let you go now since we know that you have a very busy schedule. Thank you very much. Madam Minister, you are the Minister of Digital Economy Development of Burkina Faso and have been for a long time. You've been working on uh, open source software 
in Africa. So what's your country's experience when it comes to the new issues facing the digital world today? Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. It is a great honor for me to be taking part in this high-level panel on the new challenges of internet governance and to speak about possible prospects for reforming internet governance. And I'd like to thank France for its hospitality and to also have some gratitude to Mr. Johnny Ledrian, the Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs for France, who was kind enough to invite us here. I'd also like to thank the organizers of this event, as well as you, Mr. Ambassador, for the opportunity you are giving us to take part in this high-level panel. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, 2005, my predecessor stated that only 2% of Africans had internet access, and 13 years later, in 2018, this number is 22%. Only 22% of Africans have access to internet compared to 80% of Westerners. So this clearly shows that there is a digital divide, a geographical divide that still exists. And internet access remains a major challenge for Africa. Distinguished participants, Unfortunately, this internet access challenge is now being addressed and resolved by uh, major changes in Africa, including fiber optic networks that are currently being installed, as well as international connectivity with submarine cables and uh, virtual meeting points for uh, landlocked countries like Burkina Faso, as well as internet exchange points on the national and regional level. Even if this battle is now being won, currently with the advent of various structural projects, Africa still has a long way to go. And Africa is known as being the continent where internet is most expensive with mobile operators providing their own services that are uh, perhaps in a way idiosyncratic because they supply internet access only to social media for young people. And most of these young people, when we ask them about it, they say to us that internet means Facebook, internet means WhatsApp. And this is a phenomenon that has led African governments to try to establish more services. We've talked about several factors linked to this. For example, maladapted education, lack of financial resources, um, the still budding digital entrepreneurship in Africa, as well as the issue of potential new consumers who do not get on the internet except to buy foreign products. And the second type of uh, massive divide, which is very important in Africa these days, is the divide created by the content produced by developed countries. Africa is only a consumer of these digital goods and services due to its inability as of yet to innovate, to appropriate the content, to take ownership of it itself, and to produce added value. And the social media networks that we've talked about are obviously very important tools. They help to link s citizens, help them share knowledge, they serve leisure purposes as well, but of course can be also misused, used for malevolent purposes to disseminate false information or uh, defamation. And so in Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso, the use of these networks has been extremely important. As you recall, in 2014, there was a regime that tried to rise to power partly using the social media 
asking the Burkina Faso people to accept this coup d'etat of September 2015. So in these two cases, if we wanted to put an end to the regime that wanted to hold on to power, in these cases, the use of social media was actually quite positive in my country. However, it's important to note that with the rise of terrorism in sub-Saharan Africa, fake news, disinformation, and misuse of these, abuse of these networks by terrorist groups has now become a major problem that is jeopardizing the democratic model and culture and national culture of my country. Ladies and gentlemen, the regulation of social media as mentioned by President Macron, is a challenge, is a thorny issue for many governments because we need to have to control access to inter the Internet while maintaining freedom of expression and uh, universal access to Internet. Beyond <coughs> the use of the Internet made by Internet uh, users, the fact is that Google, GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon play a very important role. They have been very successful in our countries, and yet they are not regulated on a national level. They do not have any tax obligations either. And that is why we are closely following the discussions being held in Europe, as well as by the OECD on this topic. and we as well as the president, we also call for an international initiative for a taxation of GAFA. Distinguished participants, there are global initiatives that need to be taken in order to competently address the challenges posed by the Internet. And as we all know, the Internet knows no boundaries, no legislation. And so a lack of international cooperation, I think, endangers our efforts to boost cyber security and to protect data privacy. And that is why we need initiatives such as the Budapest Convention, the RGPT for Europe, as well as the Malibu Convention. And so here, Your Excellencies, I would like to conclude my remarks by once again thanking the organizers of this event as well as the French government and all of you present in this room who are taking part in the 13th IGF. And before we move into the second interactive phase, I'd like to thank all of you and tell you how honored and pleased we are, our delegation of Burkina Faso, that is, to be taking part in this conference. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Ministre. Votre voix est Thank you very much, Madam Minister, for these very important words. I'd like to now give the floor to Mr. Stefan Richard. Uh, sea of Orange since uh, 2014, and I also would like to publicly state that your collaborators have always been here present at the IGF year after year, ICANN meetings as well, and this is that you are a very important stakeholder for us when it comes to Internet governance. And uh, you created Orange Cyber Defense. Orange is facing many digital risks. So what is your perspective on this issue overall? La grande difficulté, je... The major challenge, I think, when it comes to this digital revolution and today's Internet is that this is really a universal issue that produces both political and policy questions. You see people that have spoken today that have really talked about politics, policies, but it also has an economic aspect that is also quite potent. The economic world has changed a great deal in the past 15 years. So when you think about the fact that today, the four American companies, GAFA, actually there's, there are uh, five of them, 
with Netflix that they they actually represent more value than the Paris Stock Exchange. And with the financial resources available to a company like Apple, actually, the four major European mobile operators, Orange, Dutch Telecom, Vodafone, and Telefonica, could actually be bought altogether by Apple alone. And the fact that the equivalent of GAFA in China also constitutes a major new power. And so it's all well and good to have these debates about regulating or not regulating and so on and so forth. You know, should we be addressing the telecom sector? What should we do or not do? But what's important to keep in mind that we as economic actors, I, am, I feel a bit isolated in fact, as economic actors, we're in the middle of a war, in a world in which there is a uh, balance of power not necessarily in our favor. And this is a reality that each of us needs to keep in mind. And there are major discussions going on about regulation. Of course, as we know, American friends are not fans of regulation when you see what they've managed to do with American companies. And Chinese companies don't really need regulation either because the structure system in China actually obviates that issue. And so my point is that the issue of regulation is a very European one, actually. And what is driving, who, we, we are the ones who are driving the issue of regulation throughout the world. And we are insiders in this industry who uh, have our skin in the game every day. And the only product that Europe has really managed to export in the digital world is regulation, it said. This is true, but we shouldn't forget the rest either. We do have to ask ourselves as well about the issue of the relationship between regulation and innovation. And perhaps regulating every new enterprise or new idea in the digital world might not be the best idea. For example, artificial intelligence, we're seeing what the Chinese are, and Americans are doing in the field of AI today. And so I do want to remind all of you that today the digital economy consists of about 20 major platforms throughout the world. And there's not a single one of those 20 major platforms that's European, let alone African. They're mainly American and Asian. And when I say Asian, I mainly mean Chinese. This is the reality we live in. So where do you want to go from here? What are the European plans in this area for the next 10, 15, 20 years? This is a question that really haunts me as a CEO as well as, as a regular citizen. This being said, I am overall optimistic. I believe that the digital world can be much better than it has been in the past. I believe that digital technology can provide us with unprecedented solutions to various problems that humanity has been facing for millennia now, especially on certain continents, for example, in Africa. You are very, Orange is very involved in Africa, as you know. And I think that the digital revolution could completely change the game in Africa, could allow uh, widespread access to education, culture, health care, an example of mobile banking, which is quite unique in Africa. This is a service that has been possible, made possible with digital technology. It has allowed hundreds of millions of Africans today to have access to a a certain kind of modern economic technology through this service, which only emerged a few years ago. And so this is a host of opportunities, and I think that this could really change the course of history. So there are, of course, risks. We have to talk about them. We have to face them head on. And the most important one is cyber security, because if you created a sort of open global platform and this obviously entails risks, significant risks for cyber security. This is a problem that all of us have to deal with governments, companies, ordinary people in their everyday lives. And here the issue is how can we improve everyone's level of protection in this field? There is, of course, a technological aspect of cyber security. We also have, we're not 
we don't have the necessary skills in this area, we have to learn a great deal more. And this is a concern that every major actor in the field has to keep in mind today. We are, need to invest a great deal in this issue because we, around ourselves, are a uh, target given our customers, given the massive amount of data that we handle, that we host on our servers, makes us a target. And that's why we need to be very involved in this field in particular. But for us as well, this is a field that is very rapidly growing when it comes to expertise and the use of new expertise in this field is what we need today. And so this issue of uh, safety and cyber security is essential because it could lead to the collapse of the entire system. I think this is also a topic that uh, needs to focus more on uh, civil protection, that is to say that everyone needs to feel involved, needs to have a stake in this, including ordinary people. And so I think that we need to really understand these problems so that we can tackle them in order to fully benefit from the opportunities brought by digital digital revolution. And here international cooperation is very complex because we all know that there are governments behind cyber attacks. So we can't count too much. I won't, I'm not saying that we don't need more governance, more cooperation, but I also, as a business leader, I want to promote realism, being realistic. And there are many opportunities today in the world, but also there are many conflicting interests out there. Not everyone upholds uh, the same principles of multilateralism, universal values. We see this every day. And so personally, I think that we need perhaps more limited solutions that are more realistic with respect to this to today's world. And I think that as Europeans, we perhaps should be doing more to defend these interests because Europe is the most open platform in the world today. All of the major digital actors today know this, that they, when they have a new product that they want to roll out, they always start in the European market. Uh, and the thing is that we need to tackle all of these issues. We believe that our mission consists of bringing more connectivity, more internet access, especially in Africa, through an economic model that's uh, based on private companies. In addition, governments here and in Africa need to become real partners and not just cash cows, if you'll forgive the expression. We have another important role to play. That is, we have to help build infrastructure and take part in the various discussions on the topic. But we always have to maintain a ambitious but realistic point of view. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing your point of view. And so, Isabel, you're the head of the CNIL, the head of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners. So you are very familiar with the RGPD. This is a tool that you are perfectly familiar with since its very development, and you have also contributed greatly to promoting it and to sharing this discussion with others throughout the world, especially through this international conference that you are the president of. And you've heard, as well as we have, uh, Emmanuel Macron talk about this digital revolution. And so what is your point of view today on these issues? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone as well as my predecessors I want my and previous speakers, I would like to um, talk about this in more practical terms. I want to frame my response in the reality of regulators of personal data. So the RGPD is indeed a potential solution, but we also see that this digital society is expanding with the International Conference of Data Protection 
that took place recently in Brussels. We have 122 members today, and Africa sent many prominent representatives. There also are a number of executive commissioners of uh, this international conference, and many members of our conference and the, the countries they represent have a certain vision when it comes to digital technology, but they may not have the exact same technology, uh, same vision. And they all are legitimate in their own way. So we can see that their visions can diverge or converge. And one of these visions is the European vision, the RGPD, which was has been in development for a long time and has been applied since last May. The RGPD is an approach that was designed to address the characteristic of the digital revolution. That is a problem with trust. Tim Cook said that the crisis is real. Why is there a crisis today? There is a crisis because most individuals throughout the world feel that this digital society has le is leaving them behind. And therefore, they want to take back control over it, to take back ownership. And this is what has led Europe to come up with this uh, RGPD, General Data Protection Regulation. And this is really at the heart of the digital revolution in order to bring back ordinary citizens, help them, help, help them, empower them to guide this revolution in their societies. This is a very ambitious solution, of course, because it provides a very high level of protection but it also sends a message that we cannot have sustainable innovation without respect for privacy and for people. And so the response proposed by Europe is sustainable digital development that respects individuals. And this decision, of course, is based on a certain philosophical legacy as well as a very pro-business rationale. I'm sure you're quite aware that you can't have business without trust. If investors and consumers and employees do not trust companies to handle their personal data, then there can be no digital growth. And so Europe is gambling that beyond the protection of personal data, well, this protection actually is a wager that will benefit consumers in Europe. And I think that in the various visions of digital world that we're seeing today, this is a very clear-cutting choice. Is it going to become a universal standard? I don't know. Time will tell. But for us as Europeans, what's important is to show that this legislative framework can provide added value to regulators, to companies, and to individuals. And so in the months to come, we will see if this is a winning bet. And the second thought that I wanted to share with you is that we've heard a great deal in the previous um, presentations about multilateralism with this new emerging global digital world. All actors involved, civil society, governments, companies, regulators, all need a template for cooperation. And currently, we are trying to develop this cooperation model. And so the stance taken by the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners in October held, holds great potential because it, it is an authority of data protection, and yet it wants to innovate. It wants to contribute to this sort of sandbox for governance. And we have adopted a roadmap that aims to structure a revolution over the next few months that can actually influence the building of this digital revolution. And we are taking a certain stance that's both open-minded, flexible for new actors, multilateral, and also 
and I like to propose this today, it also asks whether the right governance model that can steer this digital globalization is actually actually consists of building a network of networks. And so uh, in the next few months, we've established a working group in our national commission in order to reflect on this roadmap, to think about how to implement it, to apply it, as well as to reflect on the possibility of establishing a permanent secretariat of the international conference and to perhaps establish this network of networks. And the third idea I want to mention is that we've talked a great deal about artificial intelligence. Indeed, this is a topic that is highly relevant today in all countries. And in many countries, we have seen very bold initiatives emerge with regard to artificial intelligence. And so, of course, the risk here is that we might end up with a very piecework landscape of initiatives with each party claiming to have a global and have created a truly global initiative. And here, the International Conference of Data Protection Privacy Commissioners wanted to make a contribution. And as said by Madam Azoulay just now, uh, we have been trying to contribute to the legislative and ethical framework behind uh, artificial intelligence. And so in October, we adopted a sort of platform that outlines the principles of data protection as well as ethical principles that authorities in all countries of the world uh, have been interested in adopting. And these principles are not, strictly speaking, legal principles. These actually are principles that fall a bit below the uh, the legal framework and can be adapted in all of the countries of the world in order to uh, promote the development of AI in each of these countries. So I believe it's important because countries as diverse as African countries, Asian countries, European countries and the Americans too have actually signed this international framework and in this international framework beyond the six referential principles that figure, there is also a call, an appeal for a framework of governance. And I believe that it is the desire of President Macron to set up a G7 or G8 meeting or an artificial intelligence and internet forum, whatever the format might be, there is, within this production that stemmed from the World Congress on Data Prote Protection, a first draft that we can work with in terms of um, governing these issues. So these were the three points I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Thank you. The boss is not in the room, uh, so I'm safe for now. So you are the CEO of ICANN, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, for those who are not familiar with the institution. It is a non-for-profit uh, corporate incorporated in, in California, Marina del Rey, not a bad place to be, by the way. Um, and you deliver a global, mich a global service to the whole community, which is basically to ensure that the internet does work. So your work is about names, numbers, protocols, but having spent days and actually nights at the Governmental Advisory Committee of ICANN, my experience is that most of the technical issues you're addressing have also a huge political impact. And this is why there are some governmental representatives also working uh, at ICANN. So what would be your perspectives on, on, on these uh, issues? Like, I guess, for example, that about data protection, you and Isabel have a lot to talk about uh, when you have time. Uh, but so, please, what, what should be your, would be your perspective on, on, on these challenges? Uh, first of all, I have to excuse them. To the embarrassment of my French teacher, I will speak my own version of English. Um, sorry about that. Um, you might need translation to English. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, thank you very much for the introduction of ICANN. ICANN is much more than a sort of non-profit. We're actually an international organization with participants from 170 countries. Uh, our latest ICANN meeting in Barcelona, we had about 3,500 people 
from among the countries. And yes, we are a pure technical organization and we have no opinions about business models or anything else. What we do basically together with our other partners in this ecosystem is to make sure that you people can connect. Um, and, 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 and we don't have any opinions about who connects to who or what kind of information they send, but we provide this simple service to the world, which is called the domain name system. Um, and, and one thing that I'm sort of thinking about, I've been doing this for many years, and I'm thinking, I wonder sometimes when the word, you know, opportunity became a challenge. And, and for right now, we seem to be in a situation where we talk about all the risks of the internet and how insanely bad it is sometimes. And it sort of strikes me that all of us here, I presume, are using internet for many things. I mean, anything from sending emails to your content to your loved, loved ones, you're doing financials, whatever you do. And that's a sort of an essential part of internet. And there are bad things on the internet, I think we all agree. The problem is, it's the one system. It's only one single technical parameter that sets this up. And, and one of the things that I'm cautious about right now, when we have this sort of narrative about everything that is bad on top of the internet, where we know, we sort of sometimes end up talking about things that actually could disconnect users from the internet. Not giving people the access to what I think is important. I mean, we say internally that you know, the reason why we do this is because when you connect to people, something magical happens. What that magic is, that's not up to us. But anything that pre prevents that opportunity could actually have an effect on, on how internet works. I mean, it's been proven to be a fairly good and stable thing because we've been doing this for many years. We've been around now for 20 years. Some of those in the ecosystems, like the, what we call the RERs, has been around even longer. And it's actually have worked. We took it from, you know, you took it from zero users to four point whatever billion users. So one word of caution in all of this is that some things of these could actually have an effect on the abilities of end users to connect to a full and interconnected internet. And that is, I think, we have to really carefully work about. And, and you mentioned GDPR. Yes, as an organization such as ICANN or ISOC, my friend Andrew sits over there, we are extremely transparent organizations. And the reason why we are extremely transparent is because everybody wants us to be accountable. Because anyone who works in this sort of part of the internet ecosystem has to be accountable all the time. You should be able to call me up and say, or actually my, the policies are set by our community, call them up and say, we are wrong, you can't do this. One of the questions that comes, for instance, with the privacy legislation is that I can't be that accountable anymore. Our ecosystem, and in this ecosystem, we have thousands of databases with names because you want to know who does what. You want to be able to, go for, for instance, go after bad actors. Or the example of who is, where I often, as a user, you know, I get an email with a link I don't recognize. I go to the who is system and checks who that actually is, just to make sure that I can do that. And we have the protocol part of the ecosystem writes down who actually makes decisions about standardization and stuff. And that's because I think that we don't see that there is this how the infrastructure, I wouldn't call it the infrastructure because the telecom operators provides the infrastructure, but this mythology of connecting people has a system. And I think that we have in that system have to be very, very accountable how that works. What people often are talking about are bad actors on top of the internet in social media and other ones who, who provides good or bad information and that's for other one than me to discuss. So maybe a fair bit of warning in all of this, with all the respect of all the opinions and all the discussions, do you really want to, to prevent people from connecting each other? I think we have to figure out a better way of having a dialogue in between each other. And I often end up being very positive to internet because I see people sharing information, I see research and service information, I, I communicate with my kids over internet. I get a lot of information, yes, not always the good one, but I get a lot of information on the internet. I live in LA, yes, not a bad place to be, uh, but some of my kids live in Europe, I, that's how I connect. And I don't want that to be a problem going forward because we see other problems. So, put in some, you know, be a little bit more positive. I just heard that was it 28% of African, 22% uh, of people in Africa getting connected to the system that I'm a small part of? That is not a problem for me. That's fantastic. So, because I want to end up with a story from South America a couple of years ago. Um, I, as some of you know, I was a telecom regulator. I was invited to, to South America, and I was doing in one country a project. 
to connect people. And I asked them why, and, and usually I always get, it's good for economy, it's good for you know, gross national product, it's good for something. But this minister told me that the reason why they do this is because access to information has always been the right of the rich people. They've always had this access to information. But if you put people online, you take away one of the d biggest disadvantages from poor people and to having access to information. And now 22% of African people can do that, which they couldn't do 10 years ago. And, in, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward when Africa is actually leading this evolution going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joran. <laughs> so, so, it appears that we still have some time for a few questions from the audience. So, should there be a question, we would be happy to take it. I don't see hands means everything's been perfectly clear. Um, but question? No questions, anyone? Est-ce qu'on peut avoir un micro? Can we have a microphone to the back there, please? Vous avez un micro? Je vous en prie. Go ahead. Uh, bonjour à tous. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, thank you for the different presentations. I would like to come back to the case of RGPD, the legal framework here in Europe. Madam, has this framework been, but well, this framework has been put, set up in Europe. However, there are many European companies that actually um, have their business activities in other parts of the world, notably in Africa. So, are these companies also going to adopt this legal framework? And wouldn't it be better to have an international framework rather than just a European framework? Isabel. Well, the response is yes. No, the um, international um, dimension of this legal framework in Europe is double because of course when companies are operating outside of Europe they must respect the RGDP but also for companies that are from outside of the European Union and who must act according to European laws, respect European laws. So, yes, this does give not just a European dimension to the framework, but also an international dimension to it. Do we have any other questions in the room? Yes, at the back there. Thank you very much. I'm Ajaji Bashabon from Chad. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the panelists. Now, again, regarding RGD, RGPD, what impact is this going to have in terms of taxes placed on businesses? Is the, is the revenue from these taxes going to go to developing the internet, or internet technology in general? Where is this money going to go? So is that what you're, you're asking? You're asking about where the money is going to go when companies are fined for not respecting the framework? Well, in fact, here in France, it will go to the public treasury in France. Afterwards, the French treasury will use the money as it wishes. But there is no specific attribution of these funds that will stem from um, any fines imposed on companies. Thank you, Isabel. I think that time is up. Uh, Minister, would you like to perhaps say a few words to close this panel session? I believe that President Macron has given us enough guidelines and avenues to explore. And I believe that there is a lot of food for thought for our different governments. And we will try and move forward, of course, with these different initiatives and try as much as possible to implement them. Excuse me, I have a question. 
if you look over in my direction. Okay, let's go through it. Over to you, sir. I'm going to try and be brief. Firstly, I'm going to present myself. Um, it's a pleasure for me because I actually um, presented the plenipotentiary um, telecoms um, summit in Morocco recently. And I believe that there is a problem. We're only looking at the regulatory aspect. But here, what we're speaking about is a revolution. That's what Mr. Macron said. It's at a political level, an economic level, a social level, a societal level. So I believe that we need to create a whole new world of regulations when it comes to telecommunications. The International Union for Telecommunication actually dates all the way back to 1960. It's Sorry, 19, 1860, excuse me. It was there even before the UN and the League of Nations. So we need to have a new form of international cooperation. That's something that we need to invent from scratch. Well, it's in fact 1865. Yes, it's the oldest UN system, uh, UN agency created here in Paris. That's true. Thank you for that. Stefan, would you like to conclude? Well, it's a difficult to conclude. But it is true that the dawn of the Internet era does pose several issues for the world in terms, for, in terms of governance. And we see that there are power relations that govern the world. I believe that the issue that is posed by different forms of governance is very complex because we have to take into account so many different parameters which bring together different stakeholders, multi-stakeholders and politicians of course. We also have different regions in the world, different types of governments, different types of, uh, well different cultures, something that may shock um, decision makers in Europe, may not shock them in Africa, for example. So this is a huge task. I believe that we have to move forward together, hand in hand. I believe that Europe has an important role to play. And I would like to say that it is actually rare to hear um, someone from the, from the telecommunications sector, a, a leader in that sector, actually saluting um, work that's been uh, carried out in terms of regulation. But I believe that this new regulation is something that's extremely positive when it comes to data protection in the world, in fact. I believe it will be a precursor, not only from a legal point of view, but we also see Facebook and Google who have already announced that they are going to set the bar to this high standard. So I believe that Europe has added a very important brick to the foundations of data protection and indeed we are concerned by these issues just like in other parts of the world and I believe it's a little bit like the fight against climate change, in fact. That is to say that it is essential to fight um, f for the cause, but of course it's extremely difficult. And it's difficult to bring all of the different stakeholders to the table. We also have to take into account the economic realities and the business realities. And yes, it's very difficult, but it's not just because something is difficult that we shouldn't actually address it. Thank you, Stefan. Isabel, some words to close? Well, yes. I'd just like to highlight the fact that we've spoken a lot about protecting um, personal data. We've also spoken a lot about cyber crime, cyber attacks, and we haven't necessarily made the link between the two. Now, it is clear that the front line, the main front line when it comes to cyber attack, is protecting data at the level of businesses, also when it comes to individuals, because any one of us could be the weakest link. 
Therefore, I believe it's very important to really foster this culture of data protection because in this highly interconnected world where every individual, every business or every municipality could be the gateway for a cyber attack, we all have to understand how important data protection is. Let's be practical then. We talked about cybersecurity and you talked about your responsibility. Can please anyone in this room now clean your cache from your web browser? Do that regularly. Clean your underwear and clean your cache. Very good. Make sure that you have a VPN and make sure that you have the latest updated software on your computer and device. That will actually take down a lot of the potential risk for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a crispy conclusion. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please a round of applause for our panelists. And now, well, you, Liu Jianmin from UNDESA, United Nations Department of Social and Economic Affairs. Before we welcome the participants of the second high-level multi-stakeholder panel. Sit on that stand. As you like. Your Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as the head of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the UNDESA, which serves as the institutional home of the Internet Governance Forum Secretariat, I'm very glad to be here and to welcome the distinguished high-level panel on strengthening the Internet Governance and, and IGF. Since the establishment of the Internet Governance Forum in 2005, in supporting the Secretary General to convene annual IGF meetings as mandated by the General Assembly, the UNDESA has been organizing the event in cooperation with the host country and is supporting the work of the multi-stakeholder advisory group. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to donors from different stakeholders for their generous contributions to the IGF Trust Fund managed by UNDESA over the past 13 years. As the event is not covered by the UN budget, we count on your continued support and also welcome support from any stakeholder in standing and improving the IGF. The IGF received global recognition as the key flag platform for dialogue on internet governance. With this mandate renewed not once but twice by the UN General Assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, while the IGF may not have decision making mandates, it, form, it informs and inspires those who do, as we see in the multiplayer effect it has on the national, regional use IGFs and NIS in short. At the same time, the UN General Assembly recognized that the IGF should continue to show progress with the strengthening participation of stakeholders, especially from developing countries. We are encouraged by the strong, diverse interests and deep engagement from different stakeholders, including governments and non-government institutions in formulating a strategic long-term view of the role of IGF and its outputs between now and 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a true digital revolution, which is considered as the greatest single enabler of sustainable development. And we are now nearing the end of the third year of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Next year, in 2019, the United Nations High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, also supported by UNDESA, will take place under the auspices of both the Economic Social Council in July, as well as the General Assembly in September. We should galvanize the momentum to mobilize technology and innovation 
for the service of people and not allow, allow them to result in polarization and division. As the United Nations General Secretary General mentioned last week during a web summit in Lisbon, we need to create platforms where governments, academia, private sector, civil society can come together and find a way to discuss and to agree on protocols and code of conduct and on mechanisms that, <coughs> that allow for the cyberspace and digital technologies to be essentially a force for good. IGF is well positioned to continue to realize this vision. At UNTSA, we are always open to new ideas and look forward to the progressive suggestions of the high-level panel on digital cooperation and the IGF community to further strengthen the role and the outputs of the IGF. Let me conclude by extending deep appreciation and thanks to the French government and the UNESCO for their excellent collaboration with UNTESA in organizing this 13th IGF. I also want to add my personal gratitude and appreciation to the French government and the UNESCO. I wish this 13th IGF great success. I thank you.